Welcome, students, to this final conceptual lecture about electrochemistry. I've had an enjoyable time so far, and I hope you have too. In today's video, I'm going to teach you more stuff about electrochemistry. Are you ready? Then let's begin. Now, if we know the EMF, or electromotive force, which I talked about in the previous lecture, to which I'll link here, of a redox reaction, then we can determine its Gibbs free energy change, or delta G. This is done by using the following equation where n is the number of moles of electrons transferred in the balanced chemical equation, e is the EMF, and f is something called Faraday's constant, which is equal to 96,485 coulombs per mole, which is the same thing as joules per volt mole. Yeah. Let's take a look at a problem then. The standard cell potential of the reaction shown here is plus 0.126 volts. The value of delta G for this reaction is how many kJs per mole? I'm not going to do this for you here, but if you wish, I'll post a link to a separate video here in which I show you how to do it on the board. Here's another one. The standard cell potential for this reaction is 0.55 volts. The value of delta G for this reaction is what? All right, let's go on. We can use the stoichiometry of an electrochemical half reaction to calculate how many grams of a substance are formed at either the anode or the cathode. How, you may ask? Well, we have to remember that there is a stoichiometric relationship between the number of electrons transferred and the product formed in any half reaction. For example, reducing Na plus to Na, as shown here, is a one electron process. Thus, there is a one to one stoichiometric ratio between sodium cation here and electron. Similarly, reducing copper two plus to copper zero is a two electron process, as shown here. And reducing aluminum cation to aluminum zero is a three electron process. So once again, there is a stoichiometric relationship between each of these ions and the number of electrons that they require to be reduced. This means then that it takes two moles of electrons to reduce one mole of copper two plus, and it takes three moles of electrons to reduce one mole of aluminum three plus. Make sense? Okay, good. So there are a few other facts that we have to remember to do electrochemical mass calculations. First, the charge of one mole of electrons is 96,485 coulombs. Second, a coulomb is the amount of charge passing a point in a circuit in one second when the current is one ampere or one amp, abbreviated as a capital letter A. Hence, coulombs equals amperes times seconds. OK, you got that down? No, seriously, you got that down? OK, make sure you got that down. Okay, we're going to go on then. So if we're given a circuit's amperage and we're asked to calculate the amount of a product formed by electrolysis during a period of time, here's what you have to do. First, convert amperage to coulombs by remembering that amperage times seconds equals coulombs. Second, convert coulombs to electrons by remembering that one mole of electrons equals 96,485 coulombs. And third, use the stoichiometric ratio of electrons to products to calculate the amount of product in question. <sighs> Are you totally confused? All right, let's take a look at a problem. How many grams of calcium metal are produced by the electrolysis of molten calcium bromide using a current of 30 amps for nine hours? Whew. To be honest, using the stuff that I just told you a second ago, I would not expect any of you guys to have a clue how to do this. Fortunately, if you wish, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I show you how to do it on the board. In fact, it applies all of the stuff that I just outlined. Now, having watched that video, and I hope you actually did, I'm going to let you try to do this one on your own. How many grams of copper will be plated out? In other words, how many grams of copper are you going to form by applying a current of 2.3 amps for 30 minutes to 0.5 molar solution of copper sulfate? <clears throat> now, for you, my YouTube watchers, I don't have a video showing you how to answer this. For my students who actually pay to take this class from me, however, I'll be happy to show you, if you ask nicely, how to do this in class. I now want to end by teaching you about rusting. Yes, I know you've been waiting for this for a long time. Rusting. Now, when iron rusts, or other metals as well, electrons move through the iron from a region where oxidation is occurring to a region where reduction is occurring. This is the overall reaction that transpires. At the cathode, we have oxygen, which has an oxidation number of zero, being reduced to oxygen two minus in water. At the anode, we have iron, which is iron zero, losing electrons or being oxidized to form iron two plus. The iron two plus formed at the anode eventually undergoes this reaction to become iron three plus in the form of iron oxide right here, which is rust, as we see in this equation. Bunch of iron two plus, bunch of O2, and a bunch of water combining in some magical way to eventually form iron three oxide right here, complexed with water. 
Let's take a look at this pictorially. We have a bunch of iron, iron metal that you might see in an iron pipe or a tool or something undergoing oxidation. It gets oxidized to form iron two plus. And then that iron two plus is conducted as an ion through the water to eventually meet this oxygen. Now the electrons that have been extracted from iron in the process of oxidation are transferred to O2 in the air to reduce the O2 to oxygen in water. As this O2 and iron two plus are exposed to each other, iron two plus eventually undergoes subsequent oxidation to become iron three plus, forming iron three oxide. Iron three oxide is rust. The rust that you'd actually see on a rusted pipe or a rusted tool or something. I tell you, when I was a kid, I remember my dad soaking all of our tools from our garage in this stuff called petroleum jelly for the purpose of keeping them water and O2 free and hence uh, preventing them from rusting. The petroleum jelly was pink, nasty goo that my dad told me would eat away my skin if I touched it. It was fun. All right, let's move on to a different subject. I once had a student a few years back email me the following question, quote, I'm not sure how they make galvanized metal and was curious as to whether its name is derived from or has any relation to the term galvanic cell. That's a good question, student from years ago. And in case any of you are wondering, I actually did answer the student directly. But I'm sharing the answer with you as well because it's kind of interesting. According to Wikipedia, quote, originally galvanization was the administration of electric shocks. It stemmed from Galvani's induction of twitches in severed frog's legs by his accidental generation of electricity. Its claims to health benefits have largely been disproved. Later, the word was used for processes of electrodeposition, which remains a useful and broadly applied technology. But the term galvanization has largely come to be associated with zinc coatings to the exclusion of other metals. Hence, a galvanic cell, or a battery, derives its name from electrochemist Luigi Galvani, who discovered it. Modern use of the term galvanization refers then to coating something with a thin layer of metal, often coating steel with zinc, usually to increase its corrosion resistance. This can be done electrochemically, a process called electroplating, which is shown here at this YouTube video, or more often through a process called hot dip galvanization, where steel is dipped into molten zinc, shown at this YouTube video. I'm going to post links here to both of these videos, which I invite you, my students, both those who are actually in my class live and those who are out there in the wonderful world abroad to watch these videos because both of them are very, very cool. One of them in particular is highly entertaining, not only because it's interesting, but also because all of the people on it have very exciting Australian or New Zealander accents. I honestly don't know if I'm cultured enough to be able to distinguish between the two. Well, that takes us to the end of this lecture video and the end of all of my coverage from Chapter 20, Electrochemistry. Please stay tuned to subsequent lectures in which I'll teach you more exciting stuff. The next one, I think, is about nuclear chemistry, and then we'll talk about biochemistry and organic chemistry. It's really exciting stuff. Until next time, my wonderful students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.